Welcome to this Sunday morning broadcast of Marvin Methodist Church in downtown Tyler, Texas. My name is Doug Baker, and I'm the lead pastor. Today, we continue the sermon series entitled Convinced, Being Certain of What God Has Done in Christ. In a cynical world where we can at times become disillusioned or disoriented in our faith, the gospel writer Luke writes his gospel in such a way that we'll be convinced that Jesus is the Christ. You might notice that we are meeting for worship in a different location while updates and modifications are being made to our historic sanctuary in preparation for our new pipe organ coming in 2025. These are exciting times in Marvin's history. Thanks again for joining us. Let's join in as the sermon is underway. When Jesus had finished saying all of this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion servant whom his servant, whose master highly valued, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders to the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man's deserving of you to do this, because he loves our nation, and he's built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far off from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and, the, and he goes, and, I, and to the other one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. Then Jesus, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house, and they found the servant well. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Well, friends, I'm not an electrician by any means, and uh, I don't really understand how electric circuitry works really well. And if, for me, it's either it works or it doesn't work. And if it's not working, you need to call someone to help you get it. That's kind of how I handle that. I do know, though, if I do try to, to work with a circuitry or anything in electrical to shut off the power breakers at the box first before you do anything. I only made a mistake one time in our closet changing a fixture, and uh, a good thing I was not on an aluminum ladder when I said that. Um, let me, uh, if you'll excuse my naivete, I want to give an analogy though today about electrical circuitry and the power of God and how God does good work uh, through faith when people ask in faith. It's my understanding the difference between a conductor and also a resistor is this. A conductor, if you uh, understand the conductor, is willing to let go or to uh, surrender, if you will, its floating electrons. So that around that atom of that conductor, there are floating electrons, and it allows it to, to allow those electrons to be uh, served and to actually transfer a current and actually share those electrons with another atom or something that's next to it. And so that is how I understand what a conductor does. It has a generosity of spirit, if you will, when it comes to its electrons. And thus, power passes through it, and uh, it doesn't necessarily have much power on its own, but it can be that conduit. It can be that pathway, if you will, and open and receptive to the flow of the current. That's what a conductor is, by my understanding. And the opposite of that is a resistor. So a resistor, by contrast, won't let go of its electrons. They hang on to those little electrons. They want to keep the status quo. They don't want to keep, they want to keep all their possessions intact. These resistors don't have much power, and they miss out on being a part of great things because power cannot pass through a resistor. Conductors, on the other hand, allow the power to flow. And they can be a part of something great, some change. I even uh, saw this illustration by a pastor who talked about, uh, well, he actually had a battery on stage. He had some electric wires. He had a big dill pickle in the middle, some more wires coming out of the pickle and a little light bulb and showed that a pickle is actually a conductor. The current passed through the pickle. And I thought, yeah, I'm not sure I want pickle juice all over my hands. And then I shake your hands at the door. We all got pickle juice. And I'm not sure that vinegar smell is really the aroma of God that they described in the temple. I just, I think it's something different. Uh, but anyway, so conductors and uh, resistors. Now, when we think about this, think about the Bible. There are resistors and then there are conductors. 
There are those that uh, uh, tap into the power of God and allow that power to, to go through them and to, to do some amazing work, and there are those that resist it. Like Pharaoh, for example, he was a resistor. He did not want to let God's people go. Think about what e Egypt could have become if they had befriended uh, the Israelites, let them go with their blessing and to see. I don't know what it, what it, what it could have meant, but uh, he wanted to hold on, and it cost him dearly to hold on. Moses, on the other hand, was not perfect, but he was a conductor. Even with his inadequacies and his shortcomings, he said yes to God, and he was willing to allow God to use him. And because of that, he saw amazing things happen amazingly powerful things happened. He saw manna from heaven. He saw the Red Sea part. He saw uh, water come forth from a rock, all because he allowed the power of God to transfer and to come into the realm in which he was living. He was a conductor. Now, King Saul was an impressive man. He had shoulders above the rest, he, but he had a problem. He learned that, that he was no longer the anointed one, and he did everything within his power to try to kill David, who had gotten the anointing of God. And so Saul, if you read in the Bible, becomes a, right, he becomes a resistor. And it costs him dearly as well. But David, on the other hand, even with his issues and his fallibility, uh, allowed God's Spirit to, to move through him. And he would provide the lineage now for Jesus Christ, whose birth we celebrate, who is our Lord and Savior. And also, we celebrate the Psalms that David has written that are a part of the blessing of our Holy Scriptures. So in our Scripture lesson today, I want to focus on a less-known conductor, if you will. This is an unnamed named centurion. And because of his faith in Jesus and his belief that Jesus could heal individuals, he asks a favor of Jesus to come and to bring healing to his servant. In a way, he has become a conductor. By his request, this servant who knows not God, who is laying there in bed close to death, will miraculously be healed because he steps towards Jesus and asks for Jesus to come and to bring healing to his servant. Now, in verse 2, the centurion servant was sick, and in the scripture it reads, he was about to die. And the centurion summoned at that point Jesus to come and to heal him. And then we find at the very end of the scripture reading I read this morning that this servant lives. He is made well. So the centurion, a conductor. His faith in Jesus to be a healer became the conduit, if you will, became that conductor of allowing the healing power of Christ to reach out through Jesus' words to this servant. That's the story we're going to look at today. And I'm going to go a little bit line by line. If you've got your Bible, you can read along with me. I'm going to do a little more expository approach, kind of un unpacking the lines as we go, going line by line. As mentioned earlier, a highly valued servant is dying in a centurion's home. Now, who is a centurion? Let's just get that out on the table here. A centurion is a professional military officer, commanded a platoon called a sentry of how many men? How many men would you find in a sentry? A hundred, at least a hundred, maybe even more. And he was known and appointed to this role of leadership because he had virtue, because he was brave, because he was loyal, because he was a man of great character. He would have been expected, though, to fight on the front line, shoulder to shoulder with his men, to be out there giving orders so that the mission could be accomplished. Polybius, who is a Greek historian, describes these centurions. They were not to be seekers of danger, but a man who can command, a man who stands ready or steady in action, a man who is reliable. They are not to be over-anxious to rush into the fight, but they are to be hard-pressed. They must be ready to hold their ground, and if necessary, they must be willing to die at their post." These men were ad admired, they were honored, they were leaders, they were men among men. They were warriors, they were take charge kind of people. But this centurion was a little different maybe than others. He had a compassionate heart. He had an empathy for this servant who had served him so well, who was about to die, and so he is going to call upon Jesus to come and heal. So the scripture says the centurion knew of Jesus' reputation as a healer, and the centurion heard of Jesus, therefore he summons Jesus to come. 
So a little bit about Calpurnium. You might recall, because we've been studying the Gospel of Luke, Jesus started his ministry coming out of his baptism in Nazareth. There he read from the scroll of Isaiah, and then there's some exchange about Gentiles that gets all the people upset, so he has to leave his hometown of Nazareth, and then he goes to Capernaum, where the first thing he does is he heals a demon-possessed man on the Sabbath in the synagogue, okay? And after doing that, then he goes well, it's probably about 50 yards to Simon Peter's house. If you remember the story, his mother-in-law is sick with a fever, Peter's mother-in-law, so he heals her. And then once the Sabbath ends, what happens? The word is out. Jesus has done this healing in the synagogue. Jesus, Jesus has healed Peter's mother. And now all the sick of Calpurnium have been brought to Simon Peter's house and it becomes a healing ministry extravaganza. Lots of healing going on and Jesus is just getting started in his ministry. Now Calpurnium, friends, is a town of about 1,500 people. So you figure that this word is out. People understand that Jesus is uh, this healing uh, prophet or rabbi. And so the centurion asks for a delegation of respected Jewish leaders to go on his behalf to get Jesus to come and do the healing. We know the centurion is uh, res respected. He is beloved by the Jewish leaders. They speak for him. They vouch for him. If you read in the scripture with me, they, they, uh, they even saw this as a great opportunity to do something nice for a man who's been good to them, who helped build their synagogue. In fact, just in speaking of the synagogue, I, the word is out to those who are going to be going to Israel uh, this year with the Marvin trip. It has been postponed a year because of the hostility in the region. And so we will not be going in 2024, we'll be going in 2025. But one of the joys is to be in Calpurnium and to actually step foot into the synagogue that uh, this centurion helped build. It's very much comes alive when you see how close it is to Simon Peter's house. And all that I'm talking about is something that will have the opportunity a year from now to walk through. But Jesus is amazingly open to this request. The request comes through Jewish leaders. It's about a Gentile's Gentile servant. And the request is for healing. Now, as I start to think about this, Jesus has already uh, got some controversy around him because he's done a healing on the Sabbath day, but yet the Jews are overlooking that. They want to help their friend who has been so good to them. And I just want to make a little side point here is that when Jesus comes around, friends, uh, good things begin to happen. People begin to collaborate, begin to work, begin to, to maybe do extraordinary things for one another. When the Spirit of God is in our midst, that's what should be happening in and around us. So Jesus goes with those individuals to heal, again, a Roman centurion's slave. This is a Gentile slave. And what I'm gonna to begin to set the stage here is, is that Luke, we know his meta, uh, uh, um, I guess we call it his meta narrative, is that God has come through Jesus Christ to save the world. It's not just for the Jews, it's for the entire world. And here we're seeing an encounter with a Gentile, and he's going to heal this Gentile's, Gentile slave, right? Okay, and that is really kind of one, uh, really, if we played the game, you want to play a little game today? We'll play uh, famous biblical centurions for five, you know, for Jeopardy, right? You remember the game? And we got for 100, 200, or 300 points, we could just play that game. This would be like the, this is like the first 100 $100 question, but the second, what would be the second most uh, centurion or uh, uh, biblical story that's of relevance? Do you know? It's at the foot of the cross. Who is at the foot of the cross? A centurion. Okay, again, a Roman soldier of high honor and prestige, a brave man who sees Jesus, the Son of God, die upon the cross, and in Mark's gospel says, Pardon the John Wayne impersonation. Surely this man is the son of God, you know? <laughs> Do y'all remember the, the greatest story ever told? That's all the line that John Wayne has. It's hilarious. They have him on the credits as, as if he's a big part of the movie. And that's all he does is make that one line, but it's a significant line. And let me just say this. In Mark's gospel, it is the peak of that gospel narrative, that climactic moment where even a Gentile acknowledges through the death of Jesus Christ that he is God's son. In Luke's 
has this story as well. In Luke 24, 47, these are the words. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, surely this was a righteous man. A righteous man, wow. Again, a great testimony of what uh, the centurion is seeing here. So we have a centurion person of faith who sees all that Jesus can do, a centurion who sees Jesus die and makes an incredible statement about who he is. And then, do you know who the first Gentile to be converted officially in the book of Acts is, by the way, written by Luke? A centurion, Cornelius in Acts 10. Do you see Luke is connecting these dots for us? And there's that conversion, that beautiful story about Peter having a vision. What God has made uh, clean is no longer unclean, and he is summoned by Cornelius to come, and he comes to his household. He preaches the gospel to Cornelius. Cornelius and his family believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are baptized, and they receive the Holy Spirit. The gospel is for everybody. There's the narrative for the world, and there are the connecting dots, and it's all connected surprisingly through these centurions. But getting back to our story here today, this centurion also is a very humble man. Jesus is making his way to his house, and the second delegation comes from the home and says, don't trouble yourself, for our master has said, you, he, you, uh, he is not deserving for you to come under our, his roof. And there we see this incredible, as if like Luke is painting the centurion, his love, as you know, the Jews are speaking good of him. And now we're also seeing now that he's also a very humble man. He's put in even a better light, right? He says he's unworthy to even have Jesus come into his house. And some commentators speculate also that the possibility is because the Jews and the Gentiles, if, you know, Jesus is already breaking this rule, right? But if Jesus were to go into a Gentile's house, he would be predicted, he'd be called unclean. It may impact his ministry as a rabbi because he'd been into the Gentile's house. Well, we know that he goes to the tax collector Zacchaeus' house. He goes to other people's homes that is not worthy. So it's not an issue for Jesus. He's on his way to come. But this guy working out of that protocol says, don't come, I'm unworthy, just, just say the word. And then he says these beautiful words. I know, because I'm a man in charge, I tell a soldier to go, and they go. I tell a soldier to come, and they come. I tell my servant to do something, and they do it. And I have faith that if you just say, be healed, even from a distance, my servant will be healed. And that is the amazing story of this man's faith. He's so humble, though. The humble spirit, let me just share this quote with you. A humble spirit is the soil in which kindness and empathy flourish. Do you have that kind of that humble spirit? I'm not worthy to, to, of God's grace. I'm not worthy to share in this holy sacrament and to, to receive God's love today, but yet I have been invited to the table and I'm invited to be a, right, a conductor of God's grace. Another quote, true humility is the art of embracing our strengths while acknowledging the greatness of others. Because this man is a humble man doesn't mean that he is thinking low of himself. He still has great power and yet He knows that Jesus is something greater. And that's why he's asking for his help to save his servant of illness. And so we see this this wonderful statement of faith that comes out in verse seven. Say the word and my servant will be healed. Friends, Luke has already established for us the power of Jesus' word, the authority of Jesus' word. Jesus says, get up, and a man who is uh, paralyzed gets up. He, 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 a man with leprosy gets healed, and he speaks, and it happens. And it sounds very familiar to the calling card of the Lord God Almighty who spoke this world into existence through his speaking of the word. And that's why we proclaim the word over the people of God. God comes and does amazing things, and things get created, and new life comes So words are not simply caused by mouth shaping air passing through our larynx. Words have power. Jesus' words have power. When you pray for somebody in Jesus' name, you are invoking the very name and authority of Jesus into that situation. And there is power in the name of Jesus Christ. Now remember, the centurion stops Jesus from coming to the home simply saying, 
Just say the word, and I know that my servant will be healed. And as Jesus commands, commends the centurion for faith, it's an exemplary compliment. Look at verse 9. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd that was following him, he said, I have not found such great faith in Israel. I have not found such great faith. Oh, to have that kind of a faith. Jesus, through your power, through your word, through your authority, bring what I'm asking for. Help me, Lord, to be a conductor of your grace, a conductor of your healing by those I pray for, by the things I ask as I strive to be in your will. But I have to be honest with you, friends. This uh, story doesn't end the way I'd like it to end. It ends with a compliment by Jesus about this centurion and his faith. And the man is healed. And then the story's over. What I would love to see is to see that centurion come out of his house, fall at the very feet of Jesus Christ, and say, my Lord and my God, praise, praise be to God who has healed my servant. Come into my house, Jesus, or let's have a meal together here, and let's celebrate this work that you have done. And maybe, just maybe, Jesus would have said, why don't you, centurion friend, follow me. Come follow me. Come be a part of this movement of God's kingdom that I'm bringing to this world. But that's not what happens. This man of great faith who is complimented on believing simply completes a transaction. Now, friends, on Wednesday nights, our missional expansion director, Adam Kovach, and I are studying the book and sharing it with the class, Practicing the Way by John Mark Comer. We're learning about what it means to be with Jesus, to become like him, and to do the things that Jesus does. And what's so frustrating about this story is I know in a town of 1,500, these guys maybe saw each other eye to eye, but the story doesn't reflect there's any reaction of him wanting to just be with Jesus or to follow in the dust of the rabbi and become a follower of the way. He just has asked for something in faith and he got it and went on with life. That's all we can kind of know. So let me just ask you this. What is faith? Faith, by biblical definition, is trusting in something you cannot explicitly prove. It, is, it has two aspects of it. We'll think, keep the electrical thing going. Two prongs of, a, of electrical current here. There are the aspects of an, an, an intellectual assent, and then there is the prong of trust. It's one thing to believe something could happen. It's another thing to trust it with your very own life. That's where I see the breakdown he believes in Jesus, but he doesn't want to trust Jesus enough to leave his career as a centurion and maybe follow Jesus. So let's talk about it this way. Brought a chair up here with me. I believe this chair can hold probably maybe 250 to 350 pounds. I think it was in engineered and designed perfectly to, to do that. And so I'm going to believe that this chair is, will do what it's created to do. But you know what the next part of that is? Do I trust it enough to place myself in that chair? I'm sure y'all are curious. <laughs> I trust it enough to sit in it. Just as I would say to you all here today, do you trust Jesus enough with your life, with your challenges, with your problems, with your struggles, or is it just like a transaction? Because friends, I believe in the atonement of Jesus Christ. I believe that Jesus' death on the cross allows me to be forgiven of my sins, but that substitutionary atonement is like a transaction, right? I receive the forgiveness in the blood of Christ so that I can be forgiven and for not be punished eternally, in he but go to heaven and be with God at the end of my life, right? That is a transaction. Because I believe that, I receive the promise. Those who believe in him will not die, but have everlasting life. But I think faith in Jesus Christ is more than a transaction. Friends, I believe believing in Jesus Christ is where we ask God to come and to walk in our lives so that we don't just have a way to get to heaven, but we have a way to get heaven into us. Not just a way to get to heaven. That's a transaction. 
right? I'm saved. I'm going to heaven when I die. That's a transaction. But I want to trust God to walk every day with me. I want to become like Jesus Christ. I want to do the things that Jesus did. I want to walk in the pathway and in the dust of the rabbi. I want to live each day. I want to be with Christ. That's what's missing in this story. Oh, it's so frustrating. He doesn't even come out of his house in this moment of jubilation. And I just want to say to each of you here today, as we prepare our hearts for communion, the centurion believed in the chair, but the centurion never placed his life in the chair. The centurion believed that Jesus could heal, and Jesus admired his faith so much to compliment him in front of many others, but he never put his own trust by what we know. There's no story of a centurion, a great leader, a Roman official who had power and authority, who bowed the knee and hugged the legs of Jesus Christ and wept at his feet because his servant had been made well and his prayer had been answered. So friends, hear me as I close. We need to be about conducting for Christ, no doubt. God's power needs to be shared, not, and we know how to connect God's power with, uh, with, the, with the hurts and the pains and the brokenness of the world, and that's called prayer, isn't it? We bring Jesus into situations that are dire, don't we, Billy, through prayer, and prayers are answered, and we've seen prayers of healing answered in our church, in our community, right? But what about the problem you're facing today? What about the challenge that got you all messed up inside today? Do you trust Jesus enough with that challenge to sit in that chair and to believe in God for yourself? I am convinced that faith, friends, is rewarded by God. Oh, Lord Jesus, help me to trust you. And as we share in Holy Communion this morning, let's not only be prayerful for others, let's not only be a conductor for others, Let's be praying that God will build the trust in our lives in amazing ways that we've never known before because we believe in Jesus Christ. Amen. Said, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Because all my life you have been fair. been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. And you have Thank you for watching our broadcast this morning. I want to personally invite you to join us for Sunday morning services here on our campus at 300 West Irwin Street in downtown Tyler, Texas. Please visit our website to learn more about our church or text NEW to 90382 to receive a personal response from our church staff. If you'd like to make a financial contribution to the church, please use the QR code on the screen for an online giving gift or send a gift to the church at 300 West Irwin Street, Tyler, Texas 75702. Thanks again for joining us, and God bless you.